Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again, and I hope that you are ready to praise and worship the Lord. You know, one of the realizations I had as a young man is that God is a personal God, and He can be intimate in as many ways as possible if you only allow Him. And the sad part is that a lot of us think that God is an impersonal God, that we cannot reach Him, that He is untouchable, and that God doesn't really care that we are just one of billions of people in the world. And how could God be concerned with us? We are just like uh, a sand, a, a bit of sand in a vast seashore. How could God possibly be interested with us. And one of the things that I discovered as a Christian is that God's immense love reaches out to all men. And if we're just willing to seek Him, if we're just willing to receive Him in our lives, we will discover a God who is not impersonal, but a God who is very personal, very loving, very caring, very kind, very intimate with His people. And that is why as we worship the Lord, understand that it is a way by which we connect ourselves to God. It is a way by which the manifest presence of the Lord comes upon us and we get to experience, we get to encounter a God who is not impersonal, but a very personal God. Allow me to read Jeremiah 29, verse 13, and it says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Friends, let us seek God with all our hearts today. And most definitely, if that is true, then we will find Him. Let's worship the Lord at this time.
Be proud.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of this morning sermon is The Greatest Invitation, Rejection, and Reception. We'll take our text from Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. Shall we read this passage together? Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. 
and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together. All they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, O God, for this blessed day that you've given us that we might be able to learn from your word and that knowing your word, we will be able to know your will. Lord, we submit ourselves today to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. As for myself, Lord, I seek that you might use me today to be a conduit of blessing to your people. Lord, bless your people, O God, as we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The time of Jesus' earthly ministry was the greatest moment in earth's history. The greatest moment in all of human history. Not only because God became incarnate, meaning God in the flesh, But he had also, at that time, accomplished man's redemption. And it was during this time that God's call to mankind was the loudest. And obviously, people at that time, in the first century, should have heeded this loud call coming from God himself, God incarnate. Because at that time, it was not just any prophet who was speaking, but the Messiah himself was speaking to the people. The people of that time, however, most especially the religious leaders, were in a business-as-usual kind of attitude, and they did not want any of this gospel business. The greatest invitation became the greatest rejection. For some, however, it was the greatest reception. And this will be our subject matter for today. And friends, we need to understand that the greatest invitation still extends up to today. And so while this story was placed in the settings of first century, we have to understand that it is just as relevant in this 21st century. And Jesus is giving you the greatest invitation of all time. And hopefully, you would be able to respond. Now, let's talk about the outline that we will be studying today in verses 1 to 7. We're going to talk about God's grand invitation to Israel. In verses 8 to 14, God's grand invitation to the outcasts and the Gentiles. And then finally, in verse 14, the chosen few. So let's unpack our study and let's begin with God's grand invitation to Israel in verses 1 to 7. And herein, in verses 1 and 2, we find the king's first invitation to the son's wedding feast to Israel. So here we find the initial rejection. So let's read verses 1 and 2 first of all. 
It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now understand when the Lord speaks in parables, he is talking about certain things that represent certain realities at that time in the first century. Most especially realities that speak about the Lord Jesus Christ and the religious setting and situation of that time. So in this particular parable, the king here happens to be God the Father. And then the wedding feast represents God's kingdom. This was the feast of feasts because this was a wedding feast for the king's son. And obviously the king's son is represented or rather the king's son represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now understand this. I'd like to give you a little cultural background during those times. Feasts like this, and we're talking about wedding feasts, would last for several weeks. And the guests were given proper accommodations, actually for free. And it happens to be the greatest feast imaginable. Here was the finest food and the most prestigious guests, because we're talking about a wedding that, the king himself had prepared for his own son. So again, we're talking about the finest food and the VIPs of all time. It is therefore unimaginable that anybody would refuse such an offer. I mean, if I were invited in a feast like that, as prestigious as it is, I would definitely attend. And if I ever have other schedules on hand, I'd probably cancel them just to be able to attend this once-in-a-lifetime feast. Many people, however, just don't know what they are missing. And the people of the first century did not know what they missed. In fact, this was a statement that the Lord Jesus Christ had made. The Lord Jesus said, you have missed the day of your visitation. It was the most important visitation of God to the nation of Israel, and yet they failed to recognize the Messiah. They failed to receive the Messiah. Which reminds me of an illustration. There was a woman whose name was Rose Crawford, who had been blind for 50 years. And then this is what she said, I just can't believe it. She gasped as the doctor lifted the bandages from her eyes after her recovery from a delicate surgery in an Ontario hospital. She wept for joy when for the very first time in her life, a dazzling and beautiful world of form and color greeted eyes that now were able to see. The amazing thing about the story, however, is that 20 years of her blindness had been unnecessary. She did not know that surgical techniques had been developed and that an operation could have restored her vision at the age of 30. The doctor said she just figured there was nothing that could be done about her condition. Much of her life could have been different. That would have been true if she had her surgery at the age of 30 instead of the age of 50. And sadly, when it comes to the matter of salvation, this is so true when it comes to the people of the first century. They were so blind to the truth of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ happens to be the light, the true light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And no light can shine brighter than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But sadly, the people at that time were so blind, they could not see this light, this light of the world, Jesus Christ. And I believe that is still true today. There are still way too many people who are still blind today. Jesus shines his light. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, that He enlightens every man. And yet we know 
that people love darkness more than light. Now, going back to the wedding feast, salvation is much like this feast. It is the feast of feasts. It doesn't get any better than that. Why? Because the greatest gift to mankind is eternal life. Eternal life wherein you are able to know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yet sadly, people did not recognize the salvation that was being offered to them right at that moment. You know, someone has called John 3.16 the heart of the Bible gospel in miniature. It is so simple, a child can understand it, yet it condenses the deep and marvelous truths of redemption into these few pungent words. Take, for example, the word God. God is the greatest lover. Then it says, so love, the greatest degree. The world, the greatest number. That He gave, the greatest act. His only begotten Son, the greatest gift. That whosoever, the greatest invitation. Believeth the greatest simplicity. In Him, the greatest person should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference and have the greatest certainty and an everlasting life, the greatest possession. It doesn't get any better than that. And it is not a complicated invitation. It is an invitation for us to submit our will, our person, our lives, our everything to Christ. And you might say, well, if I do that, then what is going to be left with me? Friends, let me tell you this. If you are searching for the greatest joy and the greatest peace in life, it can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why even as God asks us to surrender our lives to Him, understand that He has our best in mind. He desires to give us blessing upon blessing. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, every spiritual blessing. He is a generous, magnanimous God. So as we empty our hands before Him, as we surrender our lives to Him, to, to Him, He fills it with His goodness, with His favor, and with His grace. Now again, as we talk about this wedding feast, the king says that this was a wedding feast for his son. And again, this son here represents none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who happens to be the central figure in this kingdom. And that is why, dear friends, it is very important that we understand that this kingdom really is all about this king. Jesus Christ. And sadly, even amongst a lot of preachers, they have made Jesus Christ not the central figure, but the peripheral figure in the kingdom. And a lot of times we hear preaching that exalts uh, prosperity, exalts abundance, exalts success, and many other things. And so Jesus is merely an add-on. Or Jesus is merely the springboard to all these blessings and prosperity and success and fame and all of that. And it is so sad. Why? Because Jesus happens to be the center of gravity. And this Jesus is offering us the greatest possible gift that you and I can ever have in this life and in the next. And sadly, as I mentioned to you, the people of that time did not respond. And people, even today, have difficulty responding to the love and the magnanimity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moving on with the parable, it says, And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Now, this may be representing God's invitation through John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist happens to be the herald, the one who was supposed to prepare the way 
for the Messiah. And that is why he was calling people to repentance and he was calling people to have their lives changed by the power of God. And so the slaves here might represent God's messengers or messages calling people into the kingdom and to salvation. And of course, you and I know that the main protagonists of this would be John the Baptist and his disciples. Now, sadly, here's the response of the people at that time. They were unwilling. Now, who were those who had been invited? Well, probably this refers to the religious leaders of that time. Of course, you can also say the general public or all of the Jews. However, it says here that they were unwilling. Unwilling is in the Greek imperfect and signifies repeated unwillingness. So this was not a one-time rejection. This was a continual rejection by the religious leaders and the masses. And again, if we think about it, the Lord had been so gracious to continually invite His people. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ had said that He was like a mother hen that desired to bring the chicks under her wings, but they would not have it. Sadly, even as the Lord reaches out in His love, as He invites people to salvation, as He invites people to know Him and surrender their lives to Him, people shun and reject that invitation from the Lord. So in this particular case, we find the Jews, the religious leaders, they rejected the invitation since probably they felt they were saved and they were qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you will go to the Gospels, one of the reasons why they felt they were qualified was because they were sons of Abraham. And by virtue of their physical lineage, they already thought that they qualified for the kingdom of heaven. But you and I understand, as Paul explains in the book of Romans, a Jew is not one who was uh, he, he was not one who was circumcised in the flesh, but rather he was one who was circumcised in the skin of his heart. And so that is the true Jew, not the one with physical circumcision. And by the way, when you really look at history, history has proven that the greatest persecutions, the greatest opposition that have come the church's way has come from the religious sector. And why do you think this happens? It is because people are self-sufficient, people are self-adequate. And for you to tell them that they have a need, for you to tell them that they are a sinner, insults them. And that is why they reject salvation because they believe they have a great part in the matter of their own salvation. And if someone comes and says it is a free gift of God, they are insulted and they probably feel great regret if ever they receive Christ because they've done all these good works and they don't want those good works to go to waste. Paul, however, said that he considers all things as loss, even all the accomplishments that he had made as the Pharisee of Pharisees. Now, as we look at this, this, of course, is also a picture of all those who have rejected Christ all throughout the centuries, not just the first century. And I'm reminded of a story by Walter Knight, who tells of a woman who was trapped on the top floor of a burning building. Flames and smoke blocked off every way of escape. And when the fire department arrived, one of the men scrambled and put up a ladder to the window where the lady was screaming for help. And with outstretched arms, he offered to save her. But when she looked down and saw the great distance to the ground below, she panicked and she drew back into the room. The man attempting the rescue begged her to trust him for her safety, but his pleas were not heeded. In senseless fear, she retreated beyond the fireman's reach. And finally being forced to return to the ground, the fireman said with tears 
in his eyes. I did everything I could to save her, but she would not let me. Isn't that the same story of mankind? Jesus has done everything. He had done everything he could to possibly save mankind, but majority of mankind would not let him. Now let's go to the king's second invitation to the son's wedding feast to Israel. And here we find the final rejection in verses 4 to 7. And so let's talk about this stronger invitation. The second invitation was a stronger invitation. It says, again, he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Now, this may represent God's invitation through Jesus Christ. In spite of the initial rejection, God still continued to invite them. The phrase, I have prepared my dinner, by the way, is a focus emphasis in the Greek, which highlights the fact that it is God himself who has authored this great dinner, which we call redemption. Isn't rejection of this sort the greatest insult to God himself? So think about this. Salvation is monergistic, meaning to say it is all by God. God had prepared everything and all we need to do is to partake of the feast that God himself has prepared. So here is where we find the mercy of God. God is still a God of many chances. Few monarchs were known for their humility and patience, especially in the face of open insult. And so if you think about this in terms of first century culture, if you rejected the invitation of the king, you could die by hanging. You could be impaled to a post. You could, you could be beheaded for doing such a thing. And yet, here we find this king being so gracious, so generous, so magnanimous. And this is who our God is. Many of us have insulted God. Many of us have mocked God. Many of us have not repented. Many of us, in spite of the many ways by which God tries to bring himself or bring ourselves to himself, we tend to still reject him. And that is so unfortunate. In fact, in this particular case, God made the invitation even more inviting. The Lord Jesus Christ made the offer so attractive. Listen to the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time. John 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring. John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So here we find that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is, is trying to make the offer of salvation even more attractive by saying that he is the be all and the end all of life, that only he can truly satisfy, that only he can truly provide redemption, that only he can give us peace, only he can give us joy, only he can deliver us from the power of sin. So friends, the Lord expounds on the matter of salvation and all we need to do, all that people needed to do was to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let us know, similarly, God shows the Jews through Jesus Christ the greater depths of His salvation for us to be attracted to it. And so that is what the Lord has done. 
And if you understand the depths of salvation, what it entails, what is included, then friends, you should not, in logic, reject it. Let us also remember that this invitation spanned about four years, combining the ministry of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this was a long, long invitation. It's not like Jesus comes into the scene and then he disappears after making an invitation, or that John the Baptist comes into the scene and disappears after making the invitation. No, we're talking about four long years. And in the time when Jesus was doing ministry, he was doing everything. He was providing evidence after evidence that he indeed was the Messiah. He was performing miracles left and right. Signs and wonders were being performed. When he spoke, he spoke with so much authority and so much power that people were hanging at every word that he was saying. And yet sadly, that was not enough. It was not enough. And that is why instead of reception, you have a stronger rejection in verses 5 and 6. But let's read verse 5 first of all. It says, But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. So here we find they paid no attention, which tells us what? The people were indifferent. The attitude was basically, so what? So what? If this salvation is so great, if this redemption is so great, so what? It was business as usual for the people. They were more concerned about their business profits than this occasion of the wedding feast. Instead, what we find here is they gave priority to other things, and more often than not, it is really money that takes away our concern and our desire for spiritual things. In truth, the Pharisees of that time, even the Sadducees and the priests, they were all materialistic. In fact, they even thought that their material blessings were a sign that God had favored them, that God loved them, that they were doing exactly what God wanted them to do. And it blinded them to their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, similarly, in our case, in the 21st century, we celebrate things of this world and we never listen to the cries of our heart that needs salvation. May it be, dear friends, that we listen to that cry of our heart, that vacuum inside of us, that, that hollow portion in our hearts that is crying out to be filled by God and His redemption. And friends, as we move on in verse 6, it says, And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The others became even more violent in their rejection of Christ. And when we take a look at what happened during that time, this may be referring to the suffering, the violent suffering that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ had to go through. They were mistreated. Here was John and Jesus inviting them to receive the greatest gift to mankind. And instead of receiving a wonderful reception, they were instead rejected and violently dealt with. In spite of the many chances, the Jews and religious leaders just continually rejected God's offer. Oh, what sad, sad miserable tragedy this is. I recall the story that while Andrew Jackson was president of the United States, there was a man who was given a court trial and condemned to die. President Jackson offered to pardon him, but the Attorney General of the United States and others earnestly endeavored to convince the man to accept the pardon. They tried to impress upon him that it would not only spare his life, but that if he did not accept the pardon, it would be an insult to the president. The man, however, persisted. The attorney general consulted the Supreme Court asking whether legal authorities could not force the man to receive the pardon. The court ruled that the pardon was merely a printed statement until the man accepted it. And if he rejected the pardon, it remained 
printed matter. So here's the sad part. He was being given a presidential pardon. Yet even with the persuas uh, persuasive words of, of the Attorney General, in spite of others earnestly telling him to accept the pardon, he refused to receive the pardon. And I don't really know the reason why, but if you were in his position, if you were in your right mind, why not receive the pardon? And this is true, isn't it, when it comes to salvation. The Bible is very clear. It's good news. It's the gospel. Jesus has done it all. He has performed it all. All we need to do is receive the free gift of salvation. And yet, some people do not want to be pardoned. And you could say that the main reason, perhaps, why people do not want this quote-unquote pardon from the Lord is because of their spiritual pride. They think they're all right when they are not. They refuse to admit that they are in need of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. So what happens in this parable? Well, in verse 7, we find a strong judgment. It says, But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And you could sort of say that this was really a prophecy regarding the destruction of Jerusalem, which actually took place in 70 AD. When the Roman general Titus conquered Jerusalem in that year, he killed some 1,100,000 Jews and threw their bodies over the wall and slaughtered countless thousands more throughout Palestine. In his Jewish war, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem, graphically chronicled the horrible scene. And this is what he said. The building, the temple at Jerusalem, however, God long ago had sentenced the flames. But now, in the revolution of time periods, the faithful day had arrived. The 10th of the month, lo us the very day on which previously it had been burned by the king of Babylon. One of the soldiers, neither awaiting orders nor filled with horror of, of so dread an undertaking, but moved by some supernatural impulse, snatched a brand from the blazing timber and hoisted up one of his fellow soldiers, flung the fiery missile through a golden window. And when the flame arose, a scream as poignant as the tragedy went up from the Jews. Now that the object which uh, before they had guarded so closely was going to ruin. When the sanctuary was burning, neither pity for age nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old people, laity and priests alike were massacred. The emperor ordered the entire city and sanctuary to be razed to the ground, except only the high towers, Pasael, Hippicus, and Mariamne, and that part of that wall that enclosed the city on the west. I'd like us to note, what is more horrible, however, is the punishment that will meet us in eternity. This was just temporal judgment for the Jews at that time. But what is of greater punishment is eternal punishment. Today, Jesus meets, meets us as, as one who seeks to save. The future, however, will present himself as one who judges. In his book, Discover Yourself in the Psalms, Warren Worsby recalls a story told by an evangelist he heard many years ago. It went like this. In a frontier town, a horse bolted and ran away with a wagon that had a little child in it. Seeing that the child was in danger, a young man risked his life to catch the horse and stop it. The child who was rescued grew up to become a lawless man. And one day, he stood before a judge to be sentenced for a serious crime. Now, the prisoner recognized the judge as the man who years before had saved his life as a child. So he pled for mercy on the basis of that experience. But the words from the bench silenced all his pleas. 
And this is what the judge said, Young man, then I was your savior. Today, I am your judge and I must sentence you to be hanged. Now we move on and talk about God's grand invitation to the outcasts and the Gentiles in verses 8 to 14. Here we find the king's invitation to the son's wedding feast to outcasts and the Gentiles. It says, Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets. Now, in this particular case, the word invite happens to be an aorist imperative, which speaks of a command that should be immediately followed. Well, that basically tells us that salvation is never optional. If it is something that is commanded, if it is something that needs to be done, in fact, what does the Bible say in the book of Hebrews? The book of Hebrews says, today is the day of salvation. In other words, we are not to tarry, we are not to delay, we are not to procrastinate. The moment salvation is offered to us, it is a command for us to receive it. And so it is not optional. And to make it optional is going to be tragic on our part. Thankfully, we find a strong response here in verse 10 or the second part of verse 10. It says, And gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with the dinner guests. Now this represents the lay people and even the scum of society, the prostitutes, the tax gatherers who responded to this invitation. And of course, we can also think about the Gentiles as well who responded to this invitation, this gospel invitation. And so where we find that the religious leaders and majority of Israel rejected Christ, we find that there was a wonderful, wonderful response coming from the dregs of society, coming from the Gentiles who were considered as outcasts. At that time, a Jew would not even walk or eat together with a Gentile, but they are the ones who responded to the invitation of salvation. In verses 11 to 13, however, we find a fake response and a fatal repercussion. Let's read verse 11 and 12. It says, But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. This assumes that the guests would have been supplied with robes by the king's servants since all the guests came in a hurry and most were unsuitably attired. And at that time, there had to be a wedding attire. Now, there was one, however, who was not dressed, which means that this man was never dressed because this is actually a contrast emphasis in the Greek. He was never really dressed for the occasion. And what does that tell us? He was a gate crasher. He was not supposed to be there, but he gate crashed. It says that he did not have wedding clothes and garments, as we very well know, represent at times salvation or righteousness. In Isaiah 61 verse 10, it says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So again, what does this represent? Well, the one who did not have wedding clothes represents those who are not genuine believers, but they have attached themselves to Christianity. And I believe the greatest example of that would be Judas himself. Judas was with the Lord for three years, even performed miracle signs and wonders, raised people from the dead, cast out demons, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ said he was not clean, meaning to say he was never saved at all. So it's even possible 
to be attached to Christianity. And it is even possible to enjoy the power that is found in Christianity. And yet, not to have a genuine relationship with the Lord. So what awaits such people? In verse 13, it says, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what he's saying to us is for such pretenders, there will only be damnation. You know, a cow will never be a car even if it stays in the garage for 100 years. And the same thing is true. Even though these people had attached themselves to Christianity, it doesn't make them a Christian. A person does not just become a Christian just because he happens to attend church gatherings or sing Christian songs. There needs to be a true, genuine relationship. And that can only happen when you have genuine faith and genuine repentance. Genuine faith in the finished work of Christ. Genuine faith that only Jesus can save. Genuine faith that good works cannot save you. Genuine faith that only the blood of Jesus can cleanse and wash you. Genuine faith that salvation is not by good works, but a gift, a grace, unmerited favor given by God. And the flip side of faith is repentance. Be begging God for, for changes in, in your life, asking for forgiveness for all your sins. And remember this, you cannot change yourself. Only Jesus can change you. And that is why salvation is not just about the cleansing of one's sins, but it also speaks about empowering to live this Christian life. And that happens because when you receive Christ, you receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one that sanctifies and changes you. And so, the indwelling presence of the Spirit, by the way, is one of the proofs, one of the evidences that you are truly a child of God. As the Bible says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Finally, we look at the chosen few in verse 14, and it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. God calls all men to repentance, but only a few respond. We have to understand that the desired will of God is for all to come to saving faith. But the decreed will of God is such that only the chosen are truly predestined for salvation. The Bible says that we are to pray for all men, for God desires all men to be saved. But again, sadly, only few respond, and those who respond are the chosen ones. Let me share to you a little story which somehow depicts this truth. There was a maid by the name of Maggie Shields who worked in a large home in Edinburgh, Scotland. Having suffered from an incurable illness for some years, she recognized that she would soon die. Yet with her sins unforgiven, she knew that she was not bound for heaven. And one day the staff was informed of a gathering in the drawing room where some guests were to be addressed by John Thompson, a former fisherman who was now uh, now made in it who now made it rather his business to witness mainly in the slum districts of the great city maggie was very happy to hear the news for she thought she would probably learn the way of salvation from this plain spoken street preacher when all had arrived however the servants were dismissed and the door was shut so what did Maggie do? Well, lingering in the hall, the maid returned and pressed her ear to the keyhole where the preacher was preaching. The speaker was bringing a thrilling message about the good news that sinners may drink of the water of life freely and receive eternal life through faith in Christ. 
But sadly, the aristocratic company was little moved. They were unmoved by the itinerant evangelist and he saw no results in that room. A few weeks later, Mr. Thompson was asked to visit a young woman who was dying. Actually, the young woman was none other than Maggie. And the girl he called on was Maggie. She repeated the words he had said. If anyone puts his name into this whosoever text in Revelation 22 verse 17, he will be saved. Your listeners that day were not interested, but I was, said Maggie. I asked the Lord to make me his child, and I felt the burden of sin roll over, roll from my heart. Now I can die with the blessed assurance that heaven lies ahead, because God's whosoever took me in his peace and joy now floods my soul. I thought you should know that I was saved at the keyhole. Many are called, but few are chosen. The greatest invitation turned out to be the greatest rejection in the first century. But the greatest invitation should be given the greatest attention and the greatest reception. Others have done so. For others, God awaits a response. For some, God gives a second chance. I hope and pray that you will attend the Feast of Feasts and accept salvation in your life. And if somehow this message has touched your heart, I want you to come to the Lord and beg for His mercy and ask for the free gift of salvation. And if you don't know how to pray, I would like to guide you in a prayer of surrender. But again, understand, it is just a guide. What you need to have is faith and repentance. And if you have faith and repentance, the words that we will speak or you will repeat after me will just be an expression of the reality that is inside your heart. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask for forgiveness for all my sins. Cleanse me and wash me from all unrighteousness. In Jesus, I receive the free gift of eternal life. I understand that only you can save my soul and that only your precious blood can wash all my sins, past, present, and future. And today, I surrender my life to you. I make you my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you that you have received me into your kingdom. Empower me, Lord, as I repent of my sins, that I might be a new creation. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, if you have uh, received the Lord in your life, I would like to invite you to come and attend our church. We are located here in Good Shepherd Road, Banawa. And we are just about 200 meters from the main road. Uh, You will not miss our building and we would gladly welcome you. And for all the rest, uh, we'd like to invite you to continue to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. And please hit the notification bell so that we can update you with our videos. At the same time, know that we have uh, a TV program under uh, GCTV and also Light TV. And we are also in FEBC stations all over the nation. God bless you all. We'll see you next weekend. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. A radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. 
As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Greetings everyone. We already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Cebuano service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234481. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount. Enter the name LWCCCII and account number 001-0000060800 and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.